Thursday, March 29th, 2012. I am Elreen Thurlow Bauer, MSW, LCSW. On behalf of the California Social Work Archives, also known as the CSWA, I will be talking with Suzanne Dvorak Peck as part of the CSWA vi Video Oral History Project. Sue is the 2011 recipient of the George D. Nickel Award for Outstanding Professional Services as a social worker. During the course of her career, Sue has worked in many arenas, both micro and macro, as well as at the local, state, national, even international arenas. Her focus has been twofold on the vulnerable populations we social workers traditionally serve and on the advancement of our profession. Sue, it's a pleasure to talk with you this morning. Your achievements and honors are numerous. We would need a much longer time to cover them, the, the full scope of all you've accomplished in your career. So let's go back to the beginning. Could you tell us how you got involved in social work? Well, first, before I answer the question, I'd like to thank uh, CSWA for the opportunity to share some thoughts today. It's a real honor. How I got into social work or how I became involved in social work goes back a long way. I grew up in New Zealand on a sheep station and I went to a one-room schoolhouse with no more than 15 children, tops, in the whole school. And there was a great sense of community and of taking care of one another. I think that was very important. In my family, both my uh, parents and my extended family, there was a sense of making a difference in this world, making the world a better place, making a contribution. And when we talked about what I would do when I grew up, the emphasis was on doing something that would involve giving back. My mother and father both were involved with volunteer work. My mother even had a friend that was a social worker. But I think things clicked when I went, uh, I was at SC. Uh, I was an undergrad uh, psychology major. And we went on a field trip to USC County Hospital. And there I had the opportunity to see a professional social worker in action making a difference for many individuals and their families who had been overlooked by mainstream society. That was it. I wanted to be a professional social worker. I wanted to have the ethics, the body of knowledge, the tradition that this person had learned about. So I got back on the bus after the field trip, and when the bus landed at USC, I literally jumped off the bus and ran to the School of Social Work. And there I had the opportunity to meet with the Dean of Admission, Stick Thor, who happened to be in the office that day. And I said, I would really like to be a professional social worker. And he listened to me intently. And then he said, well, I have to tell you that the class has already been accepted for this year. And furthermore, you have no real social work experience. We talked some more, and at the conclusion of the conversation, he said to me, would you like to be interviewed for the waiting list? And would you like to make application? And I said, I would love to. In August, prior to school beginning in September, I got a call that I had made the class. Mm. Um, I'm very grateful that USC School of Social Work took a chance on me. I feel I had a wonderful education here. I had top professors. Uh, my policy teachers were Francis Feldman, Nori Class. My practice teacher was Reno Patty. My thesis advisor was Mari Hamovich, and I learned about child welfare from John Milner. So it was the creme de the creme. Um, 
I also am grateful that my education prepared me not only for traditional social work roles, but non-traditional social work roles, like politics, business, relating to other cultures, and even talking to the head of a television network about making sure that we could have a social worker on a prime time show and negotiating that opportunity. Wow. <laughs> That's quite an evolution and quite a uh, legacy that you inherited and took advantage of, Sue. So you, uh, how did you start your career after you graduated? What did you go into and where did that lead? Well, I view myself as a social work practitioner. And I've worked in the public sector, the private sector, and in private practice. And throughout my career, I've been a field instructor. And as my career evolved, I began to move into more macro roles. And I began to feel that as a professional social worker, if we are going to empower others, we must be empowered ourselves. I hope that my contribution to social work has been and will continue to be to broaden our view of ourselves as more active players in the power arenas. How did that come into action? What did you, how did you determine or how did you see that the profession needed empowering itself in addition as we're working with communities and populations that need empowering? How did you, how did you see that and how, where did that lead you in the field? Well, I think when I was growing up, I reflected back and, and I, I think I recognized that of all the opportunities that were presented to me as a profession, that social work was not mentioned. I'm grateful I found social work. What was always mentioned was law and medicine and, and many other opportunities, and I felt that it was important that we empower our profession so that it becomes more of a household word or words. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How did that lead you into your uh, involvement with NASW? You've had so many different things. You've been uh, California ch uh, chapter president, you've been the national president, You've gone on to the international uh, scene, which has passed NASW, I realize. But you've been very involved with uh, uh, NASW and the professional organization. How did you, why did you go that route? And why do you think that was important in your own development and contribution? Well, it's a very clear <laughs> image. Um, when I began my first social work position at Vista Del Mar, one day, the agency director, Marina Applebaum, took me aside and she said, Sue, if you're going to be a professional social worker, you must belong to NASW. And I felt very good when she said that because I already belonged. And then she followed it up by saying, Sue, you must be not only a mailbox member paying your dues, you must participate in the work of your profession. You must be on committees, you must participate in the ethics work, the practice work, uh, and many other things. And she said, uh, uh, you cannot leave the work to others. A few people cannot do the work for a whole profession. About two days later, there was uh, a meeting that Marina was going to. It was the Family and Children's Council. Mm -hmm. And she took me with her. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. I joined the Family and Children's Council and gradually became more and more involved and mm -hmm. began to see that how valuable it is to work together. So you really had a mentor helping you lead you into this and, and seeing the importance and even taking you to the meeting. <laughs> right. I guess she was one of many mentors that you have uh, uh, been impressed with and, and have followed. It sounds like a very rich um, 
footsteps that you're following in. Yes, I'm very grateful as far as, as NASW goes. Uh, and I'm only mentioning Californians. There, there are tons of others. But uh, um, Chauncey Alexander, who headed uh, NASW for 12 years, was, was certainly a mentor. Uh, Eleanor Belzer, the first uh, a Californian, served on the board with me at uh, the national level and in California. Uh, she was the first person, uh, I think, in this country to sell a private practice. And her real passion was uh, social justice. Glenn Allison uh, worked with me. He was a former congressional staffer. Worked with me to help build our political capacity at NASW. Uh, more recently, the past president, Jim Kelly, who we know, a Californian, work together. John, Jan Lee Wong, mm -hmm. our executive director. And before Jan Lee Wong, Ellen Dunbar. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful, uh, as I said, for my education and all the people that have been there for me over these years. When you were at NASW, when you were elected president, can you tell us a little bit about the two years that you were there as a president? what you, what the issues were, what you found as your focus. That's a limited period of time to be there. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you, and what, what were you trying to do? Well, it meant working very quickly. <laughs> uh, since NASW mm -hmm. National Office was in Washington and I lived in California, it meant uh, uh, working, working efficiently and effectively. Uh, I had a chance at NESW, an opportunity to really, it was a wonderful experience, to impact our clients, our profession, our society on a, on a very large scale. And I think that, that the working with the boards, working with staff, working with volunteers was non-replaceable. I mentioned that Glenn Allison helped uh, us to build our political capacity through our PAC. I think a primary activity was building influence, building access, and being able to build a um, PAC that was able to contribute to social work issues and clients to the tune of six to seven figures per year. Um, that gave us a sense of capacity. It was fun being able to move the national office from the suburbs mm -hmm. to prime real estate mm -hmm. uh, close to the capital. Talk about visibility. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, we called that a home of our own, moving near the capital. Other issues, image. Um, Again, raising money and targeting mainstream media like Oprah and NPR to be able to carry the message. Uh, in California, uh, you, Elreen, developed a centennial exhibit as part of uh, the Image Council. And this, this centennial exhibit told the story of social work in the last hundred years. We took that all over the and, state. And you were one of the five social workers in different fields of practice who was chosen to be uh, exemplify what uh, current social workers do. <laughs> I had to insert that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, other, other significant um, uh, areas we worked on uh, at the national and in California were in interorganizational relationships. In a, and trying to bring together other organizations, both consumer and professional, to achieve more. Uh, in California, we established the California Council for Psychiatry, Psychology, and Nursing, social work and nursing. And what we dealt with were turf issues, scope of practice issues. Uh, we created another organization called the California Coalition for Mental Health, where we brought in consumer groups and solely worked on client issues. For example, homelessness in the mental health population. 
Um, California uh, work involved licensing, standards, practice, and these are important not only for the profession but for individual social workers because through this work, hopefully we increase salaries and we increase insurance reimbursement. You mentioned um, visibility. What prompted your interest in social work and the media? And, and can you tell us a little bit about that, both the work with NCN here in California and at the, at the national level? I think a couple of things. What, uh, one thing that prompted me is the little that we see on television is usually inaccurate and many times shows a social worker taking a children from taking a child from a family. Um, I wanted to change that. Um, also, I felt if we are really about empowering this profession, social workers and clients, we must be able to have more accurate portrayals. And yet the dilemma with having that is that we don't have the mega millions to create that through the media. So I tried to think about how could we do that with the resources that we do have. And it occurred to me that we have a wonderful strength, and that is the tremendous amount and array of diverse expertise that resides in social workers all over this country. And the media needs good, accurate information. Why not bring the two together? Stories. <laughs> yes. And, and, and why not uh, create an entity using a social work model in which the media can come to the social worker. The, the media is the client. The social worker is the service provider. Come and get the information needed. And uh, we, were, we, we did intakes with media. Uh, we started with client uh, is. Uh, we, we considered self-determination at all times. We made referrals to social workers who had expertise. And we evaluated the process and, and did research. So that was NCN. And that was one of the strategies created in order to uh, impact our role in the media. The, the results of that um, were a television show in the 90s called The Trials of Rosie O'Neill. This evolved from consultation with social workers by the, the writers, producers, directors. Um, we produced with uh, CBS 48 Hours uh, a segment called Somebody's Child involving foster care and social workers in Stanislaus County. Uh, PBS consulted with us. We were on CNN Day Watch, the Today Show. Um, the results were very gratifying. And uh, this work is really the foundation of today's more social media, internet-based work that NASW is involved with. <coughs> Can you tell, going back a little bit, can you tell us where, when you were president at NESW, about the, um, the checkoff, the negative checkoff? Oh. Because I think that's an important concept. Yeah, the negative checkoff uh, is a means whereby when members renew or join, they have an opportunity to painlessly check a box which contributes whatever amount they want to political action and it's usually ten dollars mm -hmm. and we work tirelessly to get passage of that in the organization mm -hmm. and uh, you can do a little math and see that if you have a hundred and fifty thousand social workers and only two-thirds of them check the box 100000 with $10 each, that could be a million dollars a year of money that would go to, to issues, 
candidates, um, social workers. And, and we tried to support social workers, talking about non-tradition social roles. We tried to support social workers who were running for office at whatever level. And there are a fair number of, of social workers, I think three members of Congress and, and uh, several others. Did you run into, you said you worked hard to get this through. What did you find, what resistance did you meet, and, and if you can remember, and how did you deal with that? Well, I think any time that you're trying to empower people, you, you may encounter resistance mm -hmm. at doing things differently, mm -hmm. of moving from a comfort zone, of being more proactive. You're changing a culture. And one of the, the questions that always came up was being entrepreneurial and raising money and making money, is this in conflict with social work values? Mm -hmm. And I would have to say emphatically no, mm -hmm. not if we are doing this mm -hmm. to serve our clients, our profession, and our society. Mm -hmm. So is that a hard sell? No, no, no. Um, uh, I think once people put the different pieces together, uh, but I think it takes the, the time and the planning to orchestrate changes. Um, uh, the person who stands up and recommends something is, is only um, the pitch person mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. a great deal of other work. Well, that brings up something interesting that, that in our talks together and thinking about this interview today, um, that you portray yourself as a, as a private person, and yet when I look at this long list of, um, you've been the president of everything that can be associated with social work and beyond, and, and the president is a very visible role, yet so I think you have some, I don't know, some secrets or something to share with us about how you can be a visible person and a, and a pitch person or a face person that people associate with many of these wonderful organizations and yet uh, work behind the scenes in some way. Do you have any, anything to share with well, us I, I about think that? that? I know that I'm putting you on the spot. Not, at, not at all. Not at all. Um, when you look at a, somebody's resume, um, it's not the person alone. Uh, I've always worked with lots of people in organizations, and, and I, I think that all of this has contributed. Um, when we achieve or accomplish something, it may involve a hundred people or more mm -hmm. in different roles and mm -hmm. at different times. Mm -hmm. um, I will, if I have to go in front of a camera, I, I will <laughs> and I can do it, but it is not my first choice. I would rather share that role with others. Mm -hmm. But in order to empower the profession, um, it was important to, to take on these roles, mm -hmm. but then uh, to find good helpers. Mm -hmm. Well, and colleagues. I know as we've spoken, you you've indicated, you've talked already about being both micro and macro, and you've talked about non-traditional social work and some of the applications of social work principles in dealing with these different groups and so on. Could you say a little bit more about what some of those social work principles were that enabled you to go outside the traditional role and in dealing with non-traditional groups for us, including the media? Well, I, I think that we need to have a big picture. I think we have to, it, it sounds very um, trendy today, but we do have to go outside the box. We have to look at social work, I think, from the outside looking in. Um, I think that we need to use our education in many venues. That's one strategy for changing the perceptions and getting the word out about we, what we do. Um, I've been in, in groups or committees and somebody said, oh, you're a social worker. 
um, I didn't expect this. And, and to then have the opportunity to be able to deal with that issue and, and to take the time to deal with that issue. Um, if you've ever been on an airplane and somebody says, what do you do? You know that if you do it <laughs> adequately, it's going to be another hour. And you maybe <laughs> won't get to work on that speech that you have lined up. Uh, uh, that did happen to me once with Mike Wallace. I was seated next to him going to Washington, and he, he and I engaged in a, uh, a very long discussion about social work. I was hoping for a... Uh, full-scale piece on 60 Minutes. It, it didn't happen, but... Uh, didn't that have to do with some kind of a, an early cell phone? I think that's a wonderful story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I had a, a cell phone that was the size of a brick, and, uh, in the early days. and I'm in the early days, and uh, I, I felt that it's very important for social workers to have the tools. If we're going to defeat poverty in this country, we have to have all the tools that that the network and the television studios and everyone else has. And I was seated next to Mike Wallace, and he did not have a cell phone. And he, it, the conversation started with asking me if he could use mine, and then, what do you do that you need a cell phone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit, somehow you're moving up, up, up from local level to state level to national level, and, and uh, I know many of us would be interested in hearing a little bit about the international social work and what does that mean, what does it involve, what, what meaning has that had for you, and how do you see that in, in the large picture? Well, I'm still involved as, as ambassador to the international. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the International Federation is made up of 80 countries, 80 social work associations, uh, representing 500,000 social workers. Um, the International um, coalesces around issues like human rights, social justice, self-determination, uh, social independence, interdependence. Uh, the International has representation uh, at the UN, in the non-governmental organization mm -hmm. committees. Mm -hmm. um, it's an, a wonderful opportunity, again, for us as social workers in this country to learn from others around the world, but to also empower ourselves, work with governments to change some of the policies. Um, one of the experiences that I had that was very illuminating was the opportunity to help create a Human Rights Commission. And uh, to that point, we certainly developed policy around human rights, but with the Human Rights Commission, we were then able to intervene on behalf of social workers who may, in the course of their work, have been detained or even killed. Mm -hmm. um, another um, piece that I am still involved with to a great extent is the development of a friends program in which it seemed logical that why should only a few people have access to the International Federation? Why not create a means whereby individual social workers can participate and have a kind of membership and, and share in the work and the conferences and the policy papers? So that has been a, a, a challenge and, and fun and uh, we, uh, we have monthly uh, Skype conferences and, and trying to find a time where people from all around the world, like uh, Nairobi, Santiago, Vienna, uh, Geneva, uh, and New York can come together. Uh, so that all be awake. Uh, be awake. That was time. the challenge. <laughs> that was the challenge. <clears throat> Are students involved in that at all? Are there student exchanges, or do you know anything about that? Yes. Um, in fact, there are opportunities for students to um, come to the conference. There, there are certain scholarships available for students to come. Uh, and in fact, our UN representative in New York today started as a student uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. he came with his supervisor to mm -hmm. the to the meeting and participated, and now uh, has evolved to mm -hmm. the UN. Fascinating. It, it 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 certainly puts things in perspective that 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 the issues we're dealing with here are, are certainly massive and difficult, uh, but um, we have some infrastructure that many countries don't have. And uh, the opportunity to share how some countries are doing things with so little uh, uh, is, is very important learning experience for us. Have you found uh, in the last uh, few years that there's been more of an emphasis upon women in developing countries and in countries where the cultural values are so different and we read about these horrific kinds of things. Yes, um, I, I think we see um, uh, at, at the international level, um, it used to be the leadership w was male. Mm -hmm. And this is changing uh, mm -hmm. dramatically, and we find people in in certain uh, situations that are terribly articulate, um, have so much to offer, but never had the opportunity before. Mm -hmm. A technical question: Is it like the UN, where uh, you have the language things, or do most people speak English at that level when you're? No, it is like the UN. It's mm -hmm. one country, mm -hmm. one vote, mm -hmm. and there are three official languages. Mm -hmm. And that is what makes meeting in conferences mm -hmm. very expensive and difficult, because the languages are, are Spanish, French, and English. Mm -hmm. And that could evolve as the world evolves. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the internet has helped us be able to translate policy papers. Mm -hmm. But I'm always amazed when I go to an international meeting and I'll be sitting next to somebody who speaks seven languages. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, I, mm -hmm. I may be getting by with uh, mm -hmm. one or two. Mm -hmm. Is China represented in this, uh, at this yes. international? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. We're here at the University of Southern California. I don't know if the camera can pick up that we're looking at this beautiful banner. California Social Work Archives, Preserving Our Social Welfare Heritage Since 1979. Um, I know that that ties in in some way with the uh, California Social Work Hall of Distinction, and you were one of the founding members of that group. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement at SC and over the years and with the Hall of Distinction? Well, the Hall of Distinction was really the dream of, of Jim Carls. Uh, he had a vision that social workers in California should be recognized for their exemplary work. And um, I can recall having lunch with Jim one day and his sharing the idea with me. And he and I shared uh, the mission of empowering our profession. And I said, I think it's a wonderful idea, Jim, and I'd like to help any way that I could. Um, before I knew it, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were having meetings. Uh, lots of, of social workers, uh, other than myself, were founding members. Uh, mm -hmm. Frances Feldman, Ruth Britton, uh, Monica White. Um, I think Jan Lee Wong was at a meeting uh, or so. And th these were the early days. Mm -hmm. And um, Jim was the kind of person that was able to be a very creative thinker. He was then able to implement his ideas and then institutionalize them. Mm -hmm. And with the help of the USC School of Social Work in which the Hall of Distinction resides, mm -hmm. uh, he was able to do this. Our, our Dean Flynn and, and other faculty people were very helpful in this. And um, uh, the Hall of Distinction is certainly uh, institutionalized at this time. Uh, we have a very robust program of lots of nominees. It's a hard decision to make a selection from so many excellent people. And I, I think we could say to Jim, mm -hmm. this is something you wanted to do, and it's been achieved. Mm -hmm. And I think it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Pardon my ignorance. 
is it uh, is it honoring USC people or is it statewide social it's workers? It's statewide. It happens to to reside here, but it's statewide. Mm -hmm. We hold the, the uh, award ceremony in the north mm -hmm. and in the south, and it alternates. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we honor um, not only deceased members of the profession, but living members of the profession. And uh, it, it's a, uh, I would recommend it uh, if to people to, to go and uh, see it in action. Uh, it'll be happening uh, very soon this year in conjunction with the NESW conference. North or south? This will be south. Mm -hmm. Of all the positions you've held in all the different could, arenas, could, of, could yes. I say one more thing? Of course. The Hall of Distinction is part of the California Social Work Archives, mm -hmm. and um, that's an important relationship. And the archives has always been very supportive, and I think that has a lot to do with the leadership, uh, Esther Gillies, and a number of, of others. But mm -hmm. she's worked very hard to make sure this would happen. Mm -hmm. And here you are, <laughs> getting your oral history mm -hmm. interview. <laughs> of all the positions that you've held and, and numerous places that you've found yourself, can you single out one or two to, to tell about that were uh, especially satisfying personally or professionally? I know that's hard to do, but... Uh, no, I, I, think, I, I think I have to say the role is not what I would single out, mm -hmm. but the function of empowering mm -hmm. our clients, our profession, our society is what I would would want to relate to. Um, it, it's been um, very gratifying to see social workers and organizations find themselves uh, in a position where they can do things they hadn't done before. Mm -hmm. That is truly been a reward for me, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to fight on. <laughs> fight on. <laughs> um, you've already talked about the big picture, and I'm wondering about the uh, what you learned from these experiences that you have not already shared with us that were either useful to you later or that might guide others with similar objectives. You've talked about being a partner. You've talked about thinking outside the box. Um, are there other things that you'd like to add to that or enlarge that? Well, one of the, one of the difficult experiences, and, and you're never always successful, we know that. Uh, one of the difficult experiences was with the trials of Rosie O'Neill. Um, the plan was to have the main character be a social worker. And it was a disappointment that the network did not want the main character to be a social, but to be a public defender. And so what do we do about that? Um, do we give up? Do we go to another network? Um, do we fight uh, that? Do we temporize it and come back later? Um, we first have to evaluate is it possible, is this something we really want to do and need to do? Is it important for the profession? Mm -hmm. And after analyzing that, um, all the material related to that rather quickly, we decided that the opportunity to have a network feature a main character, a public defender, would allow us to bring in a great deal of social work content and social workers. And we elected to support that and move with it and provide the consultation. Um, I think we learned that by compromising, mm -hmm. working together, understanding other people's objectives, that we had a shot at 15 or 20 million Americans watching perhaps only 30, 60, 120 seconds of child welfare or mental health at a time but we were able to achieve those goals. So I think being able to compromise, being able to work with others, um, being able to put yourself in other positions, 
uh, I think the, those are important. And the team, the team uh, recognizing that you can do, it's almost limitless what you can do with other people. I would always recommend going to the best. Um, if you need help, go to the best and, and try to learn. Uh, at, don't be afraid to ask for help at any point. Well, that leads us to the um, pearls of wisdom you have for young, aspiring social workers. Well, I think one of the things that my field instructor told me, uh, this was Paul Chikahisa, and he told me that, Sue, when you graduate with an MSW, you know a certain amount, but you have so much more to learn. Because one day you will be teaching, you will be leading, you will be supervising, you'll be directing. So try to select for your initial job or jobs a place where they value your growth. And I took his advice. Uh, uh, and I had an opportunity to, um, as I mentioned, Vista Del Mar. I worked with Reuben Panner and Ed Barron and some of the greats in the field of uh, mm -hmm. child welfare and foster care. I think another thing I would say to students is that if you begin as a clinician, mm -hmm. feel free to follow your passion within the field. Move to macro. Move back and forth. I think the the people that I look up to are the people who can do that mm -hmm. and people who really um, are some of the best in the field mm -hmm. because it takes clinical training and understanding and it takes macro, the big picture, to be able to pull it off. And you never know when you have to use one or the other. I think it's important for, for students to recognize that, and they may feel alone at times, that um, there are lots of people who can help and to take advantage of that, but also to reach out and understand that organizations uh, are limitless in what they can achieve. One or two of us working alone may be limited. I, I would never have been able to do all the things that I uh, have been able to do without the help of others and without the help of the organization. Um, I may have said it already, but I think it's important for students to follow their passion. If they enjoy something, if they like it, if they believe in it, mm -hmm. they will do it well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm grateful to be a social worker. And whatever I'm doing, I'm always a social worker. Uh, I carry with me my training. Uh, and uh, every day I'm starting where the client is, no matter what I'm doing. Sue, this has been wonderful to be with you, and thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your experience, your insights, your history, and it's been a pleasure and a privilege. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Could I, could I say thank you to, <laughs> to you and all the people that have made this possible, and all the people who have been with me all these years encouraging me.